Thank you, and uh, good evening. I too would like to recognise the Gadigal people as the original owners of the land we're on tonight. Uh, I'd like to thank also the, the uh, Gowri for inviting me to talk to you tonight. Um, the experience that I've had with the, with the Picasso exhibition is just a journey that I'd like to, to share with you and go through, go through with you. Uh, I think that the, the exhibition um, is certainly one of the most important that has been put on by the Gowri in, in my now quite long lifetime. Um, and going, going through it was uh, better for me even than going to the Picasso Museum in Paris in some ways because it, it is a, 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 it's like a pricey and it in fact um, enables you to collect your thoughts instead of being hit by a huge wave of Picasso uh, there is in, in fact a, a directive that you, you're taken on a journey through Picasso's development as you go through the gallery and that, that uh, journey um, has relevance, I think, to all of us in any creative field or indeed uh, that, that, that has any interest in any creative field. I think also that as we, as we develop our own talents and as we go through life, um, we manage to assimilate experience uh, into, a, into a deeper realm within ourselves. And I think for me that, 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 that what, that's what this, uh, the Picasso exhibition has been about. Um, seeing the exhibition has really opened my mind to the fact that that growth really is at the core of our, of our existence and is one of the most beautiful parts of us being alive and indeed it is part of the beauty of enjoying art as we, as we go through it. Um, I'm reminded by the, ex by the exhibition of um, uh, John Brack telling me, John Brack was my art teacher when I was at school, uh, of John Brack telling me that um, when the first exhibition of the Impressionists came out in the late 30s and was actually kept out here uh, for the duration of the war because of the danger of taking it back during the war, um, that when uh, many Australian artists first saw that exhibition, it changed the way that they thought about Impressionism because previous to that, they'd only seen reproductions of those paintings. And they were totally unaware of the vivid colours that were actually used in the paintings. And so when they came to see that exhibition, their eyes were suddenly opened um, to, to what it was all about. And so you know, instead of seeing Van Gogh in sort of rather earthy yellows, they were suddenly hit by these stark yellows that really hit them in the face. And it's sort of like, oh gosh, that's what it's all about. And they'd been copying these paintings and they had to go back and actually changed their palettes and really made them relook at the way that art, about the nature of that art. And as I, as I went through the exhibition, um, I sort of felt really that I was on, on a life journey with, with Picasso, um, from his early student years uh, right through to his later development. Um, adolescents tend to have a short attention span, and I guess that uh, like uh, my fellow student, uh, unlike my fellow student Guy Stewart, I was a very bad draftsman. Um, uh, and I was impatient and I was not prepared to practice long enough to become a good one. Uh, whereas Guy just seemed to have it naturally and it just seemed to come from somewhere within him that he could, he could draw. Uh, John Brack, of course, had, had uh, become a great draftsman through practice, and it was wonderful to see him correct a drawing of a hand or something that, that, that one of his clumsiest students may have drawn, and to see that simply corrected with a, a very simple line. In this first, first drawing the, of the academic, uh, academic st uh, study uh, from his early days, um, it's a really just a classical a, a study of a classic figure that all art students are forced to draw as they go through art school. Uh, it's a very good one, but there's not, Picasso is not in there as an individual. It is, it is simply a display of technical, technical craftsmanship. There's no, none of the artist is in there. It could be done by any one of them, any, any student, possibly at any time in the last couple of hundred years. Um, and we, we look at it and we say, well, that's a very nice drawing, but we don't see any Picasso at all in that, in that drawing. Similarly, we're starting to see, we start to see some Picasso in the, in the nude with crossed legs.
But again, it doesn't have what I would say, what I would say any of the inner Picasso within the drawing. It is a very nice drawing. But again, it doesn't yet. We can maybe see in the toes, sorry, to draw your attention to, one of, to a small part. We can maybe see some later Picasso in the toes. But to be, to be honest, at this stage too, um, it could be any one, of an, any one of a number of artists. And when I look at these drawings, I, I feel that the painter, Picasso, is as much an observer of the drawing as I am, even though he is, in fact, of course, the creator and manufacturer of the image. This doesn't show up very well in the photo, but for those of you who have been through the exhibition, I'm sure you'll remember it. This is the first work that I came across within the exhibition that for me started to show so where I was feeling that there was some Picasso inside it. Although the African primitive, primitivism is so present in the work, and it's so reminiscent of so much of Picasso's sculpture is of Yongu culture from, from northeast Arnhem Land, um, it is a do, there's a dominant aesthetic that where I feel that Picasso, that it couldn't be anybody, done by anybody else but Picasso. Unfortunately, as I say, it doesn't come up well on a photo. But for those of you who have actually seen the work downstairs, um, it has a real presence and a, 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 for, you, for me, I feel as though Picasso has touched it. It's, it's, he is in there. And then we come on to the man with mandolin, uh, this is with the uh, details. Now, with, with Picasso's Cubist paintings, I still feel that, in fact, that it's a dis at a distance from, from Picasso, that Picasso is still playing around with, with styles and works and experimenting and not really accessing um, the, the images and the dreams that he has himself. He is still, uh, still a lot, there's still a lot of the observer in the works. It exposes his skill, but to use a culinary term, not his unami, in other words, that essential element that I would regard as being Picasso. With regard to the Cubist paintings, I look at them and I think, honestly, Braque does them better. And yet I think Picasso is so much a better painter than Braque and so much a greater artist than Braque. And so when I'm, when I'm talking about that, that inner self being available for us to access as viewers of his art, then I guess that I don't see, I don't see that element in these earlier paintings. Uh-oh. Right. For me, this is like a piece of graphic design. Very expressive of time and place, perhaps. But, and also playing around with the sculptural forms that he, that he, that he used so, so well in later years. But again, but again just a, a simple amusement. But because of my... See, I, I wouldn't mind having that on my wall. Thank you very much. And that way... <laughs> Um, uh, but for, for me, I guess it reminds me so much of Paris at that time uh, and of the, ca of the cafes and, the, and of the general lifestyle that was going on at the, the, the Picasso was living in at, the, at that time. But to be able to draw and explore styles proficiently is not to make you a great artist any, any more than to be able to cook in different styles make you, makes you a great chef. To be a great artist, one maybe it must be able to expose the beauty that rests at the centre of being. And to do this requires skill, but also an ability to access internal visions and present them un unhindered by ego or conscious displays of artistry. As John Olson expresses it, there must be nothing between the brush and the subconscious. In my own craft, I'm inspired by the Japanese celebration of small things, and I see my job as raising the awareness of the diner to the beauty of something that they may not previously have been aware of, and so thus en enrich their lives with the beauty of the things that I'm presenting to them. So to move on to the studies, with these studies, I finally feel that I'm sharing with Picasso the discovery of fragments in his mind 
that will in the future coalesce into subconscious forms that will flow to your, like, like music to the ear. The ability to access this state is sometimes described formally as a form of mania. It's a state of being that enables the brain to be aware on a super sensitive level of all the experiences it has collected in all those neurons and synapses. It comes only from being conscious of that state, much in the same way as some people use meditation. I know how to access that state when I need to with my own craft, but I tend to shut up about it in case they lock you away. To watch Picasso drawing in the, uh, the films being shown next door is to watch an integrated movement. For myself, when cooking, I use all of my senses. And if I say I could work blind, it's because sight is only one of the senses. And uh, it's, it's really in the ideas and the presentation that I find the beauty. And when, I'm, when you're using this, when I, I see it in hunters in the bush. I see, I see this, this form of awareness in all sorts of people doing all sorts of jobs. And uh, uh, in fact, I was talking to Clive Robertson about it. And he said, oh, this has happened to me, he said. I said, I was, I was going out towards Uluru and I was in the middle of nowhere and suddenly I could smell cigarette smoke. And then five kilometres later, I came across a bloke smoking a cigarette. And he said, what do you think I should do about it? And I said, just shut up, Clive, otherwise I'll <laughs> lock you away. But it is a form of, it is a common form that, I mean, we regard it as a form of mania, but in fact, I think that it's just a heightened sense of awareness. Coming on then to here, now I'm starting to see the real Picasso. It expresses te the tenderness that exists in the relationship, as well as describing to us 90 years later the provincial nature of the culture. There are no minotaurs, no cubist constructions, and yet it contains such, contains such empathy that it's from the love contained within the artist for the subject that he's painting. The extraordinary gentleness of the gestures of, and of the, the looks of the two, of the, of the two dancers uh, express to us, I think, a, 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 a st again, a state of mind um, that, that just grabs you. I mean, it's, it, it, it's, but it, it comes from within Picasso and not, obviously, from within the, within the canvas. And I think that that's the, that's, re that's the point of what I'm trying to say about what I've got out of this exhibition. Then following on from the dancers, coming to this incredibly famous image. Painted only eight years after the dancer. The, acro the acrobat represents for me a free-flowing form that incorporates an almost hieroglyphic use of the brush. It reminds me of the drawings in Lascaux in that the lines are so perfect and yet unrehearsed. And that for me is one of the, the really fantastic things about Lascaux. When you think of those drawings done in the Stone Age, there were no, there was, there's no practice drawings done for, the, for those drawings of the bulls and things in those caves. The lines that were used in those paintings in Lascaux <coughs> are one-off one -off lines. And you, one might think that somewhere um, in, buried underneath there's pieces of bark where people have practiced those lines, but there's no sign of the, anybody having practiced on pieces of stone outside the caves or anything like that. It's simply done straight from the, straight from the mind and within the cave. And for me, with Picasso, this comes straight out of the subconscious and onto the page. There are two exceptions to that, which I noticed after I sort of was making these observations. One is in the hand up the top, the fingers, and the other one is the bottom, the bottom foot. That ha there's a line from the toe that just crosses over the toe there. Um, but other than that, we have that incredibly free-flowing line that comes directly from the subconscious onto the page. Now, this is a painting, not a drawing, to it, we might say. Then we come on to a painting that, for me, 
uh, is really a revolution. And it's a revolution not because it has abstracted forms or cubist memories or the, the, those, those items. The thing, that, the thing that makes this painting so revolutionary for me is the chooks. And why is that? Well, it's because any other painter of that period would not have allowed his wit to have intruded on the creation of a masterpiece. To be using the, you, it's it's not really the full painting is not in that in that reproduction, the the hen and the top figure is actually a full figure within the painting, and then the baby, the chickens along the bottom here. Um, again, you, you need to go back and see the original, but to think that, that Picasso at this stage allowed himself to use that wit within what is a very, for him, a very serious, in all other forms, an incredibly serious work of art, shows not only his, I, I would suggest, a, a self-confidence about his own vision, um, but a, a, a sense of being uh, at home with that vision and indeed proud of it and willing to, wanting to share, it, share that vision uh, with you as a viewer. But to think that, that, that he had the courage to do that as a serious work of art at that time, um, I dips me lid, as they say. Uh, it's a really wonderful painting, and, uh, and all, the more, all the more because of when it was actually done. I've, I've, just, I've, I've written it, it's just that uh, he, he allows that wit to be incorporated into such a work and the fact that he's prepared to, de to do that, I see it as a symbol of the freedom he feels in the confidence of exposing himself. And I think that that's, that is the stage that one needs to, needs to get to in order to become a, a, true, a, true art, a true artist. And that, for me, is a turning point in Picasso's career. And now my, my favourite painting of the lot the portrait of Dora Maar. Again, unfortunately, the, the, the uh, reproduced colours don't give us the sensuality of the, of the original painting. But once that confidence has been established, we can see how he's used formal construction within the painting using the linear brush strokes of the wall panelling, not only to invigorate the, the surface of the work, but also to focus the viewer's attention on the subject. But for me, the subject isn't Dora Ma. There is insight into Dora as a personality, but what we really see is Picasso's love for Dora. What we're looking at really is not a, a, a portrait of a personality, but in fact, the emotions of the painter with regard to Dora. The colours on the cheek don't re reproduce well. The painting is so sensual, it's alluring, and the, the construction really presents her to you to love as well. <laughs> Picasso uses similar constructive techniques to give drama and moment to a more, perhaps a more passionate expression in the kiss. For me, it's an incredibly interesting, incredibly interesting painting, not just because of the, uh, all the, the myriad of references from Greek art to his past to whatever. Um, the, the, the same sort of formal construction, focusing the, the attention on the drama of the kiss, the centre of the work, is amazing. But what, what strikes me is the, the look of surprise on the guy's face. He's sort of looking, he's looking past her. She's looking adoringly at, at him. And he's looking over the back past her. It's, my God, what am I getting myself into? <laughs> it really is the most extraordinary painting. But for me, I guess it's another example of the inner Picasso being present. And where is, Pica where, where is Picasso for me really in that? And that is in the, in the drama of the kiss itself in the touching of the lips. Uh, Picasso is there for me. But then looking at, th to, to then, 
understand the degree of his self-confidence, we go to something that's so incredibly simple and so incredibly witty. It's almost Etruscan in its aesthetic, and yet it's a pair of bike handles and a bike saddle. I mean, it, for, uh, it's so, such a strong, such a strong image, such a beautiful image, um, so witty. Uh, what can, really, what can one say? You, you, you gobsmacked by its simplicity. And then another sculpture that really grabbed that really grabbed me was this one, the Death's Head. And again, the photograph does not do it justice in any way. The piece itself represents decay, death. It looks as though it's just been disinterred from the ground. Um, I've, I, I, um, when I look at it, I think of it as a paperweight on, on a, a mafia king's desk or a, something like that, because it, it does throw the fear of death into you. I mean, it, it, is, it, it is such... So, so evocative of death that, I, that I've, I've, I've never seen any sculpture that is as, is as strong as that uh, in, such a, in such a basically simple form. It's filled with the nature of death and our fears and the decomposing face is almost as though it's covered with earth. Round about the time this was done, just shortly after, I was lucky enough to go, lucky enough to go to France. And the first place that I visited in France was the Moulin de Mougin at Mougin. Um, Picasso happened to be living at Mougin at the time, although I didn't know it. And unfortunately, he didn't come to the Moulin at the time I was there. But just to uh, the Moulin de Mougin, run by Roger Verger, uh, we were there on the night that he got his third star. Uh, it was an incredible night, and when one looked out from the uh, from the uh, Moulin, um, that was the landscape. That's Picasso, Picasso's view of Cannes uh, from Mougin. And when I when when I saw that painting, of course, it's not a realistic representation of the landscape, but it embodies in it all that that, that the landscape has in that area and in the surrounding countryside. It's like, uh, in the same way as maybe Brett, Brett Whiteley has uh, done, done for uh, Sydney Harbour, um, that Picasso has done for that area with that painting for me. But then as an expression of, of absolute self-confidence, at the end of the exhibition, we of course come to this image. One of the last paintings that he did, done in the last six weeks of his life. And through its simplicity, we know, we know it, it has an atmosphere, it has a thing of the death's head in it while at the same time being a child. We know that that, that is Picasso, it is the Im inner image of Picasso. It, it, it evokes the innocent simplicity of, of, that, of that subconscious vision. It's as though, for all the complexity of his work through, that, through the exhibition that we've seen, that inside, in that, sub, in that hidden subconscious, there is the child that's there, who simply had been able to develop the skills to express the visions that he's held in his head all the way through his life. And so I think that, that for me, that that's, that's why I guess that, that the exhibition has been such uh, an important one, I think, for Sydney, and I speak for myself, um, to go through that, to go through that, um, that journey with Picasso and that, that journey of his development is a great privilege. We were talking uh, p just before I came down here about the, develop the developments that are going on now um, with, con with contemporary Aboriginal art uh, and how, it, how the changes that are going on there. And uh, uh, Andrew Yap told me that, in fact, uh, Picasso had written to one of the Aboriginal artists in the 70s, 
saying that his art was what represented what Picasso was trying to achieve in his own art. Um, some of the changes that are going on now, I'm working with the Yongu up in Northern Territory, uh, and you'll see some of their sculptures down in the new Commonwealth Bank building in the foyer down there. And to look at those, you would think that they were, they were in fact Picasso sculptures. Um, so it's interesting to think that we, we tend to th think of things in terms of development and the, who influenced who, and the, you can follow the influences through into contemporary art, but in fact often it can just as well happen the, the other way around. And I guess it's those sort of realisations that we come to exhibitions like the Picasso exhibition to realise. Uh, similarly, uh, with cooking, um, a lot of the new techniques that we're using are actually used by the Yongu, but intuitively and not as, um, uh, not as scientifically as we're doing. As, you, as I'm sure a lot of you will be aware, a lot, a lot of the new cooking is done at very low temperatures. And the Yongu have one dish, I'll, I'll just tell you this, we must be getting pretty short of time now, but they do one dish where they, they take a kingfish and take the gut from the kingfish and they wash the gut and then they fill it with a fast made from the kingfish and seasonings and then they know the temperature, the different cooking temperatures of the wood. And they bury that sausage that they make at a temperature underneath the fire, which we've measured and which is 65 degrees. They then cook that sausage for about four hours at 65 degrees, brush it with ash on the outside, and then they use it for when they go walk about to do ceremony. Uh, that's exactly the same as we do with our scientific, with our scientific instruments, but they're using the fish gut as the encasing instead of, the, uh, instead of a sous vide plastic. Uh, but ex other than that, exactly the same. Um, it's a, a fascinating area that is still, still yet to be explored and that we're, we hope to do a lot more work with them up there. I'd like to thank you all very much for having me tonight. I hope that um, you, enjoy, you have enjoyed the exhibition down below as much as I have. Uh, and I'd like to thank the gallery again for having me. Thank you. <laughs>